All right, we're starting chapter 17 now. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, parties outside of privity. And those are going to be the third parties that may or may not have been involved uh, or uh, as a central idea of a contract. Um, most contracts, obviously, are between the buyer and the seller. However, sometimes, and that relationship is called privity, sometimes those parties outside that original relationship uh, have certain legal rights and or responsibilities. So let's talk a little bit about these third party rights. Okay. Um, I want to distinguish two terms for you, and uh, it can be a little bit difficult sometimes for students to keep these terms in your mind. However, there's a simple mnemonic, I think, that really helps here, and that is everybody wants an A, nobody wants a D. So I'm going to talk about assignments, and I'm going to talk about delegations. Assignments are basically positive things for the person that's getting them. Delegations are basically negative things, or duties for the people that get them. So, let's look at an assignment. An assignment is when you transfer a right under the contract to another party. A classic assignment is the right to receive money that is owed under the contract. So let's suppose I performed under the contract, and uh, I had painted your house or fixed your car, um, and you now owed me a thousand dollars. What I could do is I could assign the right to receive that one thousand dollars to another party, the party I owed money to, for example. Now, when you're doing this, you are changing the concept of privity a little bit. Privity of contract is the essential status between the buyer and the seller, that, that sort of idea that these two are in privity of contract, that they have a relationship with each others. And typically, if we only have two people, they and only they can sue to enforce a contract. But as you can imagine, using that example I gave you where I assigned the right to receive money for work I did to a third party, because of, of third party rights, the person I assign that to gains the right to enforce contract. So we've got some terminology here, and this is not the first time we're going to be using the double E and the OR. The assignor is the party making the assignment. That's the person that did the work and should be getting the money, but has decided to assign the right to receive the money to a third party. The assignee is the party who is getting the right. That's you, we'll say in this scenario. That's the person who's going to be getting $1,000. The obligor is the person who owes a duty. The obligee is the party to whom the duty is owed. So you'll see those terms used. Assignor, assignee, obligee, obligor. Assignee, assignee for assignments. Obligor, obligee for delegations. Okay, so the most common assignment that you see is the assignment to receive money that is owed at a future date. So you're probably thinking, well, I don't think I've ever seen an assignment. I don't think I'm involved in an assignment right now. If you own a house, uh, let's suppose you purchase a house uh, and you finance your house through BB&T, Branch Banking and Trust. Branch Banking and Trust has lent you money and you have agreed to pay them $1,000 a month uh, for the money they lent. And you've got a 30-year mortgage. Now, BB&T quite often will not hold that mortgage. They may service that mortgage, but they won't hold it. And by that I mean they'll take the, the right to receive your $1,000 payment, and they'll bundle it up with a bunch of other right to receive $1,000 payments, and then they will sell it. So you are paying your money to a new third party. Now, it's, it's still washing through BB&T. They're servicing it. They're making sure you pay. But they are assigning that money. Most home mortgages work this way. If you go back to the savings and loan crisis 
uh, in the 1980s or more recently in 2008 when you look at the um, subprime mortgage crisis, this was underlying the basic problem. Um, it was far more profitable for banks to write a mortgage, receiving the fees for writing the mortgage, the origination fees, okay, and then selling that debt out on the open market than it was to retain it. The end result was that banks um, needed to keep making more and more and more mortgages. Therefore, their, their, mm, how careful they were to make sure that the people they were loaning the money to were going to repay it became less and less important to them. They were willing to loan money to people who probably weren't going to repay it because they were making money on originating the loan and they were making some money on servicing the loan, but they weren't holding the loan. Instead, that loan was being sold to pension funds and other investors under the belief that home mortgages were very secure. Um, it turned out in 2008, a good deal of them weren't. And this nearly caused a wide-scale collapse of the American economic system. Okay, so what form do these assignments take? Well, they can be in almost any written or, depending on the amount, and statute of frauds might apply here, oral form. Um, usually, depending upon what is being assigned and what field we're talking about, there may be a sort of standard assignment. So, going back to our home mortgage examples, um, this can be very technical. Um, you would probably never see the assignment documents, um, and they're very voluminous. And this was part of the problem trying to unravel this mess in 2008 was, okay, let's see the contract whereby you assign the right to receive this money. Uh, when that person's no longer being paid for it, he's going to have to sue. you got to find that contract. And a lot of these contracts couldn't be found. It, it caused a huge, huge problem. But basically, there are some standard forms that are used in different fields, real estate, uh, receiving uh, the same type of assignments for goods that are sold in places like Walmart or um, I guess Kmart or Sears aren't going to be with us much longer. So remember, the form can be in almost any form and is still subject to the statute of frauds. Now some rights can't be assigned. Statutes prohibit it. The, the best example of this is Social Security. So think about this scenario if this did not exist as a, as a rule. The government, which is the absolute safest lender there is, you know that everything will collapse before the government collapses. Okay, Private banks will go belly up, corporations will stop paying dividends, and if we had a collapse, the last institution that would collapse would be the government. As a consequence, it's the safest, the most secure investment you can make. So people like to get government guarantees. Well, we know that the largest single program, uh, social program in the United States is Social Security, uh, old age retirement, basically. Um, you are guaranteed the right to receive money. Let's, again, use our standard $1,000. You have a right every month to get $1,000 or $2,000 from the government. Well, if you could assign that right, companies would line up to say, Oh, John Doe, you're, you're getting uh, Social Security. How about you assign us the right to get $500 of that a month, and we'll give you a new car or we will finance a trip to France, or we will pay for your, co your grandson's college education. Um, people quite quickly would assign their right to receive Social Security. Now, the, the, the end result of this would be um, a lot of this money would stop flowing to people who were elderly and needed it and start flowing to the banks that bought that debt. Um, so we make it illegal. You cannot assign the right to receive Social Security. There's also certain contracts that are very personal in nature that we, we don't let people assign or delegate. We also don't let people uh, make assignments that increases the duty to the obligor, or this is uh, a, a common one, if the contract expressly forbids any sort of assignment. 
Now, certain things pretty much always can be consigned, assigned. Excuse me. Um, you can assign the right to receive money, absent things like Social Security or laws against it. You can always assign rights concerning real estate. You can always assign negotiable instruments, which we're going to talk about uh, later in the course. And if there is a contract for the sale of goods and there is damages for a breach of this contract, you can assign rights under that. Um, why do we do this? Well, we want to keep capital fluid. Um, some economists will use will, will really look and say an economy is efficient and is productive when the capital is flowing very rapidly through it. In other words, one person just doesn't get it and sits on it. They get it and invest it, and the next person invests it, and the next person spends it, and the person that spends it buys it. And the dollar flows through the economy very rapidly. By letting things be assigned, we let this happen. If we didn't, um, the, we would all be poor because there would be less money. The faster the money goes from person to person to person, the more time that money can be spent. Now, usually you are supposed to give, you, you got to tell someone. So let's suppose I was, uh, I was owed $1,000 for painting somebody's house, but I owed my friend John $1,000. So I assigned him the right to receive that money. The person who is given the right, the assignee, has to notify the obligor, the person who is paying the assignment. So I'm, I'm A, B owes me money, I assign my rights to C. So C, who is the assignee, okay, has to tell B, the person who is paying, that he's supposed to get the money. Now what happens if he doesn't, if, if notice isn't given? Um, then if the debt is paid, if the obligor goes ahead and pays, um, it's the original party, me, okay, the debt is cleared. Until notice is given to the obligor, the debt can be cleared by paying the original party. What happens if I was dishonest and assigned it to two separate people? Well, the rule there would be usually the one who got it first would have priority. Now, remember I said everybody wants an A, an assignment. Very few people want a D, a delegation. So, let's flip it. Uh, the original contract um, is you are going to, you want me to paint your house. So I am painting your house. That is the job, okay? And you are paying me $1,000. Now remember, we sent in a delegation. I could assign my delegation. But let's suppose I have somebody that I don't owe money to, but in fact owes me a favor. And I say, you know, um, I don't have time to do that job. So I'm going to delegate to you that you go and complete the paint job. And then when that's done, that guy will pay me and our debt will be cleared. So let's name the parties here and make this a, a little bit easy. Let's suppose A is the person whose house needs painted. Okay? So A house is being painted. A is going to pay B. He's the house painter, okay? He's going to pay him a thousand dollars. C, okay, is somebody that owes B money. We'll say that C owes B one thousand dollars, coincidentally. So because C owes B $1,000, and because B is going to perform $1,000 worth of labor painting A's house, okay, B delegates the job of painting the house to C. Now C performs that, and A still pays B. That's a delegation. Now again, there's no special form necessary for this. Um, and the delegation does not generally release me from my obligations to perform. So remember, I delegated the job to C, but let's suppose C never shows up or C does a terrible job. Well, A doesn't have to sue C. A can go to B, me, and say, you were supposed to paint my house. My house didn't get painted. Um, I'm going to sue you. 
okay? The original obligation, the original rights of privity remain in a delegation. Now, some duties can't be delegated. Um, a duty that places special trust, uh, a duty where there's a personal skill or a personal talent, or a duty where the new party would materially alter what is expected. Those duties can't be delegated. Generally, to be a delegable duty, um, it should be something that's routine and common. It shouldn't be something really esoteric or precise, which you're going to hire the person specifically for that. So here's an example, because uh, it, it can be confusing. Um, a hires Rembrandt to paint his portrait. So A goes to Rembrandt and says, hey, I hear you're a really great artist. And Rembrandt says, yes, I am. Okay, I'm going to give you a thousand florins or a thousand dollars to paint my picture. But it just so happens that Rembrandt's friend, Johan, okay, owes Rembrandt money. So Rembrandt would like to say, well, I'll tell you what, I'm supposed to paint A's portrait and he's supposed to give me a million dollars. You go paint it and I'll just take the money. You can't do that because it, it, it's not a type of duty that's delegable. Now, if the delegation is legal and if it's not a breach of the contract, you've got to let the other person work and do the job. So let's suppose, as opposed to painting a picture, I hire Rembrandt the plumber, who's supposed to come over and replumb some of my house for $1,000. Rembrandt the plumber hires Johan the other plumber to go and do it. Maybe he's a subcontractor, okay? Again, the plumber Rembrandt still has liability, but the person who hired plumber Rembrandt has to accept the sub coming in and doing the job. Now, very often you'll see an assignment of all rights. Often you'll have clauses in contracts that say assignment of all rights. This creates both the right to assign duties and to delegate duties. Okay, let's talk about third parties here. Um, sometimes we enter into contracts for the benefit of third parties, and sometimes the contracts that we enter into benefit third parties, but it's not intentional. So let's look at intended third party beneficiaries. The classic example here is an insurance policy. Right now, I have an insurance policy that if anything happens to me, my wife receives a lump sum of money. Um, the two parties in contract, the two parties in privity, are me and the insurance company. We'll say it's Hartford Insurance Company. Now, you notice that my wife is not in privity there, but she is the intended beneficiary. In some ways, you could say, she, I'm assigning the right. I'm deciding if there's a life insurance payout, who gets it, and it's my wife. Because of that, the party who is intended in the contract has the right to sue to enforce the contract. So after I die, even though my wife wasn't in privity, she could sue to collect the money. Now there sometimes are people who benefit unintentionally. The example here would be, um, suppose I was signing a contract with you and you were going to build a brand new hotel uh, on a piece of land. And it just so happens that a third party owned another lot across the street from the hotel. And because there's going to be this massive new development, that, that third party who owned the lot, that, that lot is going to skyrocket in value because it's going to be right across the street from a hotel. And it's like, oh, great. So we have a third party here who is going to benefit from the, the contractual agreement between me, the person building the hotel, uh, and you, the person who's going to sell me the land. But let's for, suppose for some reason it doesn't work out the builder breaches it or the seller breaches it, well then the, the person who owned the lot across the street, he's not gonna he's not gonna realize any gain. Can he sue to enforce? No, he can't. He can't make me sell the land. He can't make the guy build the hotel. They are unintended beneficiaries. So there are here are some types of intended beneficiaries. There are creditor beneficiaries, parties who benefit from a contract between two parties 
the assignment from which is used to pay a debt. So, example I give here in the notes. You owe me $10,000, and you sign a contract with Fred to do some work from him, and you assign me $10,000 of the wages. That's fine. Donee beneficiaries, a contract that is a gift to a third party. Again, the most common form here would be a life insurance policy, and the person who is the beneficiary could sue to enforce. Vesting is when rights take effect and when one cannot walk away, when essentially the contract is fixed. So when do assignments vest? Well, there's two main cases here. When the third party manifests the assent to the contract, typically by notifying the obligor they have to pay, or when the third party materially alters his position in reliance upon the contract. Again, we're assuming there um, that that's an intended beneficiary not a non-intended one. How do we distinguish between, well, who is an intended beneficiary, someone who can sue, and, and an unintended beneficiary, someone who cannot sue? Well, we're going to resurrect our old friend, the reasonable man. Would a reasonable man think that the beneficiary was intended or unintended? If you would think he was an intended beneficiary in an evaluation, then that party can sue. If you would say, well, no, I, I think he's more the example of the guy that owns the lot across from the hotel, he's unintended, then he has no rights under it. We do look at facts. Was any of the performance rendered to the third party? Did the third party have any control? Or was the third party expressly designated as a beneficiary? The more contact that third party has, the more involved they are, even if they're not in privity, the more likely they're an intended beneficiary and can sue in force. All right, that's a relatively short chapter. We'll leave it there and uh, be ready for the next chapter whenever you are.